long before Ian Lancaster Fleming became a best-selling author, a single-minded Philadelphia ornithologist named James Bond wrote Birds of the West Indies based on repeated expeditions to the Bahamas and the Caribbean from 1927 to 1935. The 480-page book, published in 1936, featured black-and-white line drawings of birds by noted artist Earl Poole. It quickly became the must-have book on the subject. Fast forward to early 1952. Fleming was starting to flesh out his maiden 007 novel, Casino Royale, and needed a name for his imaginary secret agent. As he would often do when inventing characters for his books, Fleming simply lifted a name from real life. He looked at the distinctive white dust jacket of Birds of the West Indies on his bookshelf, noted the author's name in capital letters, and took it. James Bond. Welcome to Story Search from Special Collections. This is a podcast series that explores stories based on, inspired by, or connected to material artifacts, whether it's books or objects, in special collections. And uh, I am your host, Joe Shamtov, and Andrea Lemoines is my co-host. Hey there, Andrea. Hey, Joe. What's up? We, not much, but a lot. <laughs> I, can say. I don't a know. I can't figure it out. Time exactly. are, I, times are confusing, and I can't yes, figure are. out what's going on. Uh, <laughs> we have a very interesting show today. It's called Stolen Identities, The Many Faces of James Bond 007. And I'm going to go ahead, and I, Andrea, I'm going to spill the beans right now. So you, okay. don't have to, you, don't, you don't have to listen to the whole show to know that James Bond was a real person. He was an ornithologist who lived in Philadelphia. Yes, uh, Philly. Philly, yes, go Philly. Yes, you in can't the, tell us nothing. Yes. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, in the early 1900s. And that uh, Ian Fleming, who wrote the James Bond books, actually used his name, whereas Jim Wright, uh, the author of the book that we're going to talk about, uh, says he stole his identity uh, because Ian Fleming was also a part-time ornithologist. We have uh, James Wright. The title of his book is The Real James Bond, A True Story of Identity Theft, Avian Intrigue. Uh, and also we have uh, another great guest. Uh, we have Katie Berkwood, who hails from England, London, England. Uh, hey, Katie, how you doing? Hi, I'm well, thanks. Good. And by the way, I don't think I asked Jim. How you doing, Jim? I'm doing great. <laughs> Okay, yep. good. just checking to see. Good job, Yes, Joe. yes, good thank job. you. Uh, Katie is going to talk about the 007. Uh, what is the origin of 007? Uh, she curated a um, an exhibition in 2016 that had to do with the library, a library that belonged to a gentleman. His name was John D. And he lived in the 16th century. He was the advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. And somebody had said that 007 has something to do with him. So we're going to go into uh, more depth about that. So let's start with um, with uh, Jim. Um, Jim, tell us about um, how you started writing this book and what the book's about. Give us just a, a quick um, intro about it. Sure. I write a bird watching column for the record in northern New Jersey, and I discovered that Jim Bond – James Bond was, in actuality, an ornithologist, uh, worked and lived in Philadelphia for almost the entire 20th century, uh, born in 1900 and died in 1989. And uh, turns out that Ian Fleming, when he was writing his first uh, 007 novel, uh, Casino Royale, he was in Jamaica. He looked down at his uh, birding Bible, uh, Birds of the West Indies, by James Bond and said, that is the name I need for my secret agent. And uh, so he stole the name, never told uh, anybody, including uh, Jim Bond, that he had stolen his name. Mm -hmm. uh, fast forward about a decade uh, from 1952 to 1962, uh, Dr. No and From Russia With Love and Goldfinger are coming out, and all of a sudden, 
James Bond, the Philadelphia ornithologist, is getting calls late at night from breathless females. Right. Say, <laughs> Hello, is James there? And his wife would answer and didn't understand what was going on. And uh, they discovered uh, through a, like a Playboy interview with Ian Fleming that he had stolen Jim Bond's name. So uh, Mrs. Bond learned when the phone rang and asked for, is James there late at night? Uh, she would reply, uh, I'm pussy galore and he's busy. <laughs> and, that is classic. Yes. Cla- I wouldn't great. say classy, but classic. And right. uh, yes. so they wrote to Ian Fleming and uh, said, hey, I think you stole my husband's identity. And he apologized, admitted to the crime and said, if you're ever down in Jamaica, come visit me. And uh, so one day in 1964, they drop in unexpectedly. Uh, Ian Fleming is very upset at first because he's afraid that Jim Bond is there to sue him. And once he found out that James Bond, Jim Bond didn't, couldn't care less about these novels, uh, they became very good friends during the day. And right. at the end of the day, Ian Fleming signed a book to the real James Bond from the thief of his identity, Ian Fleming, February 5th, 1964, A Great Day. So the name of my book, The Real James Bond, I actually stole from Ian Fleming when he signed right. the book to James Bond. Right. Everyone's stealing each other's identities. We're going get, to yes. get into that okay. because your book is a lot deeper than that. Ornithologists stealing other ornithologists' identities. And um, I guess I know you probably want to continue. Uh, now's a good time to point out, uh, and you, I, maybe I should have mentioned that in the beginning of the, of the interview, uh, where does the rare book department, where does the free library figure into all of this? Uh, mm-hmm. it, the free library was invaluable. Uh, the rare book department has a collection of the Mary Bond and James Bond archives, and there's all kinds of scrapbooks and, uh, just amazing details that I found invaluable for the book. Uh, later on, when Jim Bond was really felt hassled by the whole James Bond connection, not just uh, breathless women calling late at night, but just everywhere he went, he was subjected to these corny James Bond jokes. <laughs> and uh, There's a lot of documentation in, in the rare book department archives of kind of the stuff that he, he went through. Uh, so it was very helpful in a lot of ways, all kinds mm-hmm. of photographs, by the way, as well, that were, uh, awesome. And I don't think I would have been able to write the book without the free library's help. The archives were terrific. Well, we we're glad that you came, uh, and researched your book, uh, using our collection because it, this is a small collection that doesn't really get, uh, any attention. And so when we, when I first started working there, it's like, you kind of overlook the James Bond thing. No, there's no way we have a James Bond collection. And then you realize, wait, there's something more to this. We actually do have a small but interesting collection. So you brought attention to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And actually, I have a question for you too, Jim, because I'm always curious, how did people find out about these collections? Like, how did you find out about the collection at the Free Library? Probably in a bibliography. <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, the The Academy of Natural Sciences across the street from you also has some James Bond archives and a lot Mm -hmm. of a lot of the rare birds that he skinned are in the collection. If you go to the Academy of Natural Sciences right now, they have a display uh, featuring the real James Bond. It's kind of fun. The uh, the library's information uh, is sort of the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, Mm -hmm. I just there was an auction at Sotheby's yesterday of a 1947-ish edition of the Birds of the West Indies signed by James Bond. And it was up for auction. And I I was dubious because I rarely see uh, books signed by Bond up for auction. But long story short, I saw that the book was signed in the Caribbean in 1958 in January. And I looked back to the archives and saw a Mary Bond scrapbook that had pictures of them in the Caribbean at that time. 
And I also had pictures of some of the signatures of Jim Bond from the library collection, and I could see the similarities. So I felt a little better about this being a genuine James Bond book. And without the library's resources there, I never would have been able to do that. Mm -hmm. Was there anything that you found that really stuck out to you in the collection? Like anything fun or odd or just really caught your imagination going through that collection? Well, I'll give you two examples. One is uh, one something that I found and then something I didn't find. Uh, what I found <laughs> was a Corgi uh, Aston Martin DB5, <laughs> a little toy uh, Aston Martin, just like 007 oh, wow. drove in Goldfinger, complete with the ejector chair <laughs> and a little... <laughs> And the little machine gun. Remember, you're showing and it to so, me. Yes, so <laughs> Jim Bond can't stand the connection, but here he has he has this little toy uh, Aston Martin, and he also apparently had a, a 007 vodka bottle in the collection, also. Wow. But Which when I was going, was that bottle from the from the set? Was it or is it just kind yeah. of a, a souvenir or? I think it was a souvenir. I tried to buy one myself on eBay, but I couldn't find any. Mm. Uh, the mm. one thing I found missing was the signed copy that I had mentioned that Ian Fleming signed to the real James Bond, the thief is from the thief of his identity. And uh, according to the library records, Mary Bond had donated this book to the library. And this is a very valuable book. And I tried to figure out what happened to it. And one entire chapter of the book is what happened to that copy. And it turns out that uh, Mary Bond did indeed donate it. A friend of her told her it was worth a lot of money. Katie Berkwood, cover so, your ears, by the way. <laughs> this is okay. a part you don't want to know. So uh, <laughs> the uh, Mary Bond called the library and had an assistant bring her the copy of You Only Live Twice, signed by Ian Fleming to her husband. And instead of returning it, she had it put up for auction at Sotheby's, <gasps> and it sold for $32,000. What? I think we should recoup our money. Yes. And then it was it was later resold at auction for uh, including all the fees and stuff, over $84,000. Mm-hmm. To, to an anonymous uh, collector. And I said in the book, you know, this book donated by Mary Bond should have been in the public view where all of us could see this right. book at the rare book department. And instead, it's in some collector's library for his or her eyes only. Right. Well, we love you donors, but <laughs> once you give it up. Yeah, it, you got to keep yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Up. So the one funny thing about once the book came out, I got this uh, Facebook messages trying to locate Jim Wright, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, I found the guy who bought the book. Oh. And he lives in the Midwest, and uh, it's one of his prize of his James Bond collection. So it's in good hands, but I wish it were in the public hands. Right. So uh, right. thank you, uh, Andrea, for asking that question because – I'm not sure, Jim, when you were researching your book, if we had that finding aid. So part of a challenge for all special collections is making your stuff discoverable. So how would uh, Jim Wright find out? So in the old days, and unfortunately still happens, it's through these bibliographies. So you're researching a book or you're reading a book and at the end, uh, there's a small notation about where that information came from. But so that's hard to do. And uh, normally it's only people who are in a field who kind of know how to do that. But so, so what we're, we, we're doing, uh, we have um, a lot of online finding aids. So we have an online finding aid on James Bond, on the James Bond collection that was given to us by Mary Wickham Bond, his wife, the widow. And we have other finding aids. So what that means is if somebody's doing a Google search and you Google a couple of words, hopefully that online finding aid is going to pop up and it's going to inform you that, hey, you know, the free library owns this. You can come and make an appointment and, and see, the, uh, see the materials. 
So yeah, that, that story is amazing with that book that she sold that belonged to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. I have all kinds of feelings about yeah, that. I know. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we all do. I, I would love to see it. Maybe I will someday. Maybe I can talk him into donating it to the free library. Ah, at some point. Yeah, well, ah, that would be wonderful. Uh, even just seeing that Birds of the West Indies sold yesterday for $4,000. No. I was thinking, you know, that that book should be, you know, in the free library or the Academy of Natural Sciences, not in someone's collection. But Jim, that's that's just me. Just out of curiosity, did he, uh, did the, uh, the person who purchased that book did he know about the story behind the book that the free library that it belonged to the free library and it was sold by? Did he know the provenance, no. the history about it? That a very good question. No, when he contacted me, I said yeah, I told him all about it. He goes, you know, I read it. I was astounded. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I just bought it. It was it had been auctioned off at Sotheby's before, and then. And then uh, it was some Hollywood uh, auction house that sold it. Correct. Because how could he know? Yeah. In other words, if the provenance, the history of the book, who owned it, when, if that was made clear, then it really wouldn't be up for sale. <laughs> you know, maybe the free library needs to be returned to the free library where it, uh, it came from. And the other thing about that book is that since I've written the book, I'm well aware of how many people claim to be the real James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> just all <laughs> over every week. There's some guy from Yugoslavia or somewhere who was a secret agent. And his name was James Bond. And this is the inspiration for, you know, 007. And, you know, that book that says to the real James Bond from the thief of his identity, Ian Fleming, it's pretty conclusive. There's not much arguing. Right. He, ad he, ad he admits it. Um, well, I think you you just stumbled upon the topic for your next book, and you can profile the real James Bond, the the other people who claim to be the real. Like, will the real James Bond please stand up? Yeah, I think I think I'm bonded out for a little while. The uh, one thing I enjoyed uh, when I researched the book was uh, all the different places I had to go, not just the Free Library and the Academy of Natural Sciences. But uh, I also went to the National Archives a couple oh. times down in Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, I stumbled across the fact that several of James Bond's ornithological colleagues were actual spies during World War II. And these are contemporaries, mm. people he worked with, and seven of them, at least seven that I found, were spies for the OSS during the war. So I had to go down there and I looked up all their records, uh, all their OSS records, which had been uh, quarantined until about 10 years ago. So yeah, I mean, the, the original quarantine, not the quarantine that's going on. Now. Let's <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. Exactly. Sorry. Bad choice of words. <laughs> no, uh, but let's step back a little bit because now you, you stumbled upon a whole other thing, which is uh, interesting. Uh, and before we step back, I want to do um, two steps back. And to situate things physically so people understand. So the Free Library is in downtown Philadelphia. We're next to the art museum where uh, you have a rocky steps, a rocky climbed up the steps. But then there's another institution called the, it used to be called the Academy of Natural Sciences. And now what, the, the title's what, the Drexel Academy of Natural Sciences? It's called the uh, Academy of Natural Sciences at Drexel University, I believe. Correct. Yeah, that which, sounds right. Yeah, other people, uh, they sometimes they refer to it as the Dinosaur Museum because they have yes. you know, fossils and things like that. That's what I call it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But it this is the place where the real James Bond worked. So he was a northern mythologist. He worked across the street from the Free Library of Philadelphia, and he worked there. And he was an amateur – I mean, he was an, an outstanding uh, researcher, academic – but he really wasn't academically trained. Is that right, Jim? Uh, certainly not academically trained in ornithology. And most of these guys in those days were not. But it was mm. a, sort of a labor of love. They learned it. A lot of them were gentlemen ornithologists. They had their own means of support, and they did this because they loved it. Uh, Bond, one of the things I found out about him was he was born really, really rich. Yeah, in Philadelphia. And, uh, He's so rich, his father was a part owner of the Philadelphia Phillies in the early 1900s. 
they had a mansion in Gwinnett Valley. Uh, then tragedy hit the hit the family. Uh, the mother died. A, a sister of Bonds died. Uh, the father remarried and moved to England. And the real James Bond, it turns out, was educated in England and had sort of a British accent, even though he was from Philadelphia. And uh, it kept coming right. across. And here we're starting things. to see. Right. And what's interesting about that is we're starting to see the similarities between the real James Bond and Ian Fleming. So Ian yes. Fleming comes up with the character. Uh, it's a fiction uh, based on his Ian Fleming's experiences in MI. Is it MI5? I was I like I get mixed up between it. Was it MI5 or am I or is it just the Navy? It was, uh, he was in the the British Navy as an intelligence officer. So he wasn't quite in MI6, I don't think. Ah, okay. Okay. And so in your book, you start listing the similarities. They start mounting. And they, they were both educated in England. Uh, and uh, they were both ornithologists. They both loved birds. That's why uh, Ian Fleming had that book on his shelf. And that's yeah. how he, he got the name. And then you mentioned... Uh, something called the OSS. I don't think people know what the OSS is. Can you get into that a little bit? Uh, that is the forerunner of the CIA. It's the Office of uh, <laughs> Secret Service or something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, Office uh, of the Secret Service. Let's go with that. Something like that. And uh, they were recruiting all these people out of the Ivy Leagues to yeah. uh, become spies during World War II. And uh, one of them was uh, Dylan Ripley, who worked uh, for the Academy of Natural Sciences, later was the head of the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History, and eventually became head of the Smithsonian. Wow. And interesting. during World War II, he was running spies for the OSS uh, in uh, in Asia. And there's several other guys just like that. A gentleman from the Academy of Natural Sciences named Brooke Dolan uh, went on a secret mission uh, on horseback to Tibet, you know, once they got to Asia, they took horseback to Tibet and met the Dalai Lama and gave him a, a pocket watch from FDR. And they were looking for alternate routes, uh, trade routes to China, which was then occupied by Japan during World War II. It's unbelievable. These, mm. you, you can't even make up these stories. And what makes an ornithologist a natural or a good candidate to uh, be in the OSS or the precursor to the CIA. What is uh, what is the skill set that that made them good candidates? Yeah, it was almost perfect. A, they have incredible skills of observation. Uh, they have been there. They've been to the countries they're going to uh, go back to, and they know the local customs. They know government officials. Uh, some of them could speak the language and. Uh, they also had licenses to carry uh, firearms in all these Unbelievable, countries. Unbelievable, right. There's a, a line in your book, and I forget which ornithologist um, you were referring to, but he's contacted, because you profile other ornithologists. It's not only yes. James Bond. And in fact, I want to take um, I, I want to take another step back. And when I was reading your book, it seems like you go into the James Bond, Ian Fleming connection right away. And then yes. you start talking about ornithologists. And then I thought, oh, uh, James Wright just tricked us. His book is really about ornithology, but he, <laughs> but he used James Bond as the hook. But it's not really true because as you continue reading, he circles back to the connection that ornithologists have with these spies. So it's, it's fascinating. And so he gets, so one ornithologist, I forgot his name. You know the name. You wrote it. It's in your book. Hmm. At, he gets contacted by an environmentalist and he says, Oh, you know, I think you'd be interested or maybe can you help us in your cause, uh, in the cause of protecting the environment? Cause you're an ornithologist. And he looked at him, he says, I shoot birds. Like I'm not into protecting the environment. Like we kill birds. We come back with thousands of dead birds. That's what I do. And oh I yeah. That, that was uh, a predecessor to uh, <laughs> James Bond. He, uh, I shoot birds. I don't protect them. This was back in the uh, infancy of the Audubon movement where they're trying to keep mm. uh, all the birds from being killed for the uh, millinery trade. Mm -hmm. But the ornithologists are, are really cool guys and they're out in the field and they 
you know, the one thing about Bond, you had this image of him as a pipe smoking yeah. uh, dandy wearing uh, fancy suits and, you know, the whole thing. And he was actually, when he was in the West Indies, he traveled by himself on horseback, on foot, <laughs> carrying a shotgun and slept in huts and in hammocks. And it uh, was half adventure. He would yeah. he would travel from island to island in the West Indies, uh, taking banana boats, rum runners, any any means of transportation he could take, he would take. And he mm. got seasick. <laughs> that was right. And, his, and he was living off his family's inheritance, right? There was an inheritance, not that much. It was a it was- tiny, tiny inheritance, and uh, he had invested it wisely and. He lived sort of like a bum. People met him on the street in Philadelphia and didn't realize, you know, he was, they thought he was on hard times because he was scrimping so much to go down to the West Indies. Right. That was part of his, uh, you know. Oh, sorry, Joe. I was just wondering, didn't he marry well? Like I read that he lived in Chestnut Hill. Yeah. So he eventually married well uh, to marry Wickham Bond. Uh And he also came into some money of his own. Uh, during World War II, like 1943, 1944. Uh, and also the one other quirky thing about Bond is his, one of his uncles was extremely rich. And uh, Bond's mother and this uncle were both uh, Roeblings of the Brooklyn Bridge Building Roeblings. So mm-hmm. they had some money. And this guy was also an art collector. And uh, if you go to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and look at the uh, Van Gogh sunflowers in the rotunda there. It's the only Van Gogh sunflowers in North America. Uh, it was donated by Jim Bond's uncle. Mm. <laughs> and I yeah. think I think the uncle probably slipped Bond some money to get by as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, the, the book is so rich with just so many interesting facts uh, and the one of the many things I liked about it is that you you go into why ornithology is important, like what have ornithologists contributed to humanity? Uh, if you can go into that a little bit, Jim, like the DNA, uh, global warming, uh, climate change, uh, that'd be yeah, great. I'd be happy to. So that's the one thing people think. Oh, these ornithologists—they just killed all these birds, and now they sit in you know museum. Uh, file drawers and and what's the point it turns out that all these uh bird skins that bond and other people collected uh are time capsules and they're filled with incredible information about the species back when it was collected and they can actually find out what the environment was like back then how much lead was in the environment you name it and what's happening is the research and the technology keeps increasing, you know, tenfold. And the, the ornithologists are eager to find out, you know, what what can be learned from these same specimens ten years from now when the technology gets even better. Right. So these scientists who are liberally taking it, killing birds and taking them back, it actually proves that it, it was very helpful in the end. It, yes, uh, and also more birds get killed by skyscraper windows yeah that's true in in a a year than all the birds that ever been collected by ornithologists the one thing i wanted to mention james bond because he was down in the caribbean he he collected a lot of really rare birds and they are invaluable today there's a, a bird called the bahama nuthatch and it's believed to be extinct and some of the only few specimens they have of this bird were collected by jim bond and uh, mm. without those specimens, you wouldn't be able to find out about what the bird was like, what it looked like even back in those days. Yeah. And uh, so his contribution is invaluable. Uh, it's, it's a, I recommend this book for anybody who's interested in James Bond or ornithology. Um, I know, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the beginning of the show, but uh, Sean Connery recently died. And uh, of course, he was my favorite James Bond. Uh, and so we have a case of stolen identities because Ian Fleming takes James Bond's name. James Bond is kind of the real James Bond is profiting in a way, uh, or maybe his wife is Mary Wickham Bond, 
they're they're getting some mileage off the James Bond name somehow, even though it's a nuisance a lot of times. And then Sean Connery kind of steals the James Bond name from Ian Fleming. And uh, there is, and you allude to that in your book. So the, the identity, the James Bond identity is very fluid and it's moving around all over the place. Yeah. Mm. And then we have the 007 intrigue. Mm-hmm. So uh, when, uh, J- when Jim Wright was researching his book, I probably didn't do my due diligence. I should have mentioned something about 007. And there, when I joined the rare book department at the Free Library, I heard from another librarian, this is like institutional knowledge, that, oh, you know, we have a map uh, that is made, handmade, a very invaluable map uh, made in the 16th, 16th century by a gentleman named John Dee. And uh, we're going to learn a lot more about John Dee very soon. But one of the things that I had heard was that 007 that came from this gentleman, John D. So here we have Katie Brookwood, who's going to tell us all about her connection to this intrigue, the 007 intrigue. Hey there, Katie. How are you doing? Hey, hey, I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, joining us. So I'm excited to hear about John D. He sounds like a very interesting person. He's great. Yes. <laughs> and one of the words I'd never use or never thought I'd use is the word polymath. <laughs> and I can <laughs> tell you how many times. It's like the opposite of a jack of all trades. So a polymath is someone who's like a master. And, and it, uh, it probably apl- it applies to Ben Franklin. Uh, it applies to John D. He was a master cartographer. She'll tell you about it. But uh, yeah. So tell us about John D., his library, your exhibition, and how – uh, you came, stumbled upon the 007 uh, intrigue. Okay, well, how long have you got? It's really, really hard to summarize, John D. Um, yeah, right. In any kind of brief way, polymath is the best way to describe him. And it's a word that could have been invented for someone like John D. He was interested in everything, just any information he could get his hands on. Um, so he lived in England In the 16th century, he was born 1527 and he died in 1609. And he was a scholar and he studied a really wide range of subjects. So texts in Latin and Greek through history, through travel and exploration and cartography, um, subjects like mineralogy, maths, health, religion, mysticism, the Kabbalah, pretty much any subject that existed at the time, he had studied to some degree. And we know this because we know about his library. Mm -hmm. He collected one of the largest libraries that existed in England at the time, um, and one of the most famous libraries in Europe. And he used this library for his own researches, but he also welcomed other people into it. Um, He wanted England to have its own kind of national library. And he put in a petition to Queen Mary to ask for that. And she said no. And he sort of took on the role himself and said, well, if we don't have a national library, I will welcome scholars into my own library. The thing he's probably most famous for being interested in is the mystical and the spiritual. Uh, He got really interested in the second half of his life, particularly in trying to communicate with spiritual beings. Um, And this is what really dominates his reputation today. He believed that you could contact otherworldly Christian angels or kind of strange spirits by seeing visions in a crystal ball or in a polished mirror. And he employed Mm. a number of people to do this for him. Um, The most famous of those was a man called Edward Kelly, who was with Dee for several years. And uh, Dee would um, set up a magical table with mystical objects on it, Um, and a crystal ball in the middle and he and Edward Kelly would say prayers and kind of supplicate themselves to a higher power and then Dee would sit Kelly down in front of the crystal and Kelly would report on the visions he was seeing um, which Dee thought would reveal information about uh, the future, about religious truth, about the political situation, about anything you you care to name in life Um, and he recorded these visions in a series of diaries Uh, that are preserved in um, a couple of libraries in the UK at the Ashmolean. No, sorry, they were in the Ashmolean uh, Ashmolean Museum. Uh, They're now in the Bodleian Library in Oxford um, and in the British Library in London. Um, So he's a really, really interesting character. And is is that, 
So how was Queen Elizabeth using John Dee as an advisor? Was it the mystical part? Was it cartography? Was it? No, so it wasn't. I think Dee would have liked to have been advising her from his mystical in um, kind of investigations, but the advice he really gave to her was much more practical. So it ranged across a number of topics. Um, one of them was definitely cartography and exploration. So um, Elizabethan England is a time of huge expansion um, in naval power and exploration of um, foreign to us lands. Um, mm -hmm. And Dee is advising Elizabeth about this. Uh, he draws her maps um, and he draws other explorers maps, such as the one in the Free Library, um, showing what he believes is out over the seas. So he draws on all of his reading on um, the history of geography and history of other explorations to try and guess what is up in the polar regions where no one has explored, certainly no one from England had explored substantially before, um, because he's trying to help expeditions that are looking for a northeast passage uh, past Russia towards China or a northwest passage um, around the top of the American continent towards um, the east. Um, and so he draws maps. He also writes a sort of a political uh, treatise for Elizabeth. Um, which he calls his general and rare memorials pertaining to the perfect art of navigation, which is a real mouthful. He didn't really have a <laughs> much of a, a skill for publicity. But what it's really about is Elizabeth's claim to territory overseas. So he draws on historical precedent and mythic tales of British tribes having crossed the Atlantic and reached the American continent to say to Elizabeth that she has claims to lands in North America. Yeah. So it's propping up colonialism, really, um, and sure? saying to the Queen that she has rights to, you know, countries all over the place um, to which England has no previous connection. Um, but he also advised her on other things as well. There are just a few nice um, examples I might give. He picked the date of her coronation. Um, so before she became Queen, he was asked by some of her advisors, could he use astrology, please, to work out the best day? So he cast a horoscope and chose the 15th of January, 1559 for her coronation. He also advised her um, when there was a comet appearing in the sky and the court were very scared about what this might mean. It was taken to be a bad omen. And he reassured them that it was just a natural phenomenon and nothing to be worried about. Um, and he also advised her about her toothache and her arthritis. And he was sent into Europe in 1578 to um, go and consult with physicians in Germany to find um, cures for the Queen's toothache. Ooh. Yeah. And this is at a time when, even with all this, John Dee is not an outlier. This is not atypical. There is a, a very small distinction between uh, astronomy, astrology. So in other words, mm. after his death, and correct me, Katie, maybe I'm wrong, but as I understand it at the time, it wasn't really unusual to have that, but his reputation was maligned uh, after his death as being kind of really out there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are lots of people, you think of a lot of the um, big names of the 16th century, um, and they were all interested in things like astrology and um, alchemy in particular. Um, so, for example, Paracelsus, who is a big name in the history of medicine, um, was an alchemist, essentially, de essentially devising new medicines based on the minerals and salts and metals that he was brewing up in his laboratory. Um, or you think of any of the uh, other physicians of the day, they were all using astrology to govern medical practice. Right. Um, so that wasn't at all unusual. Yeah. And it was part of a, a drive to understand the world based on the, the knowledge and understanding that they had already. So they were trying to work out how the world hung together, but they only had the kind of intellectual framework that existed already to base it on. Where Dee probably was an outlier was his really deep engagement with the spiritual world. So lots of people had written about that, but not so many people actually believed they were communicating with spirits in this direct way. Um, and that gave a really easy route into maligning Dee in the subsequent century. So his and some of his angelic diaries were dug up out of his garden in the early 17th century um, by an antiquarian called Robert Cotton, who wanted to find out more about Dee, partly because of his library and his collecting interests. And um, eventually they were published as an edition um, called A True and Faithful Relation of, oh, something or other. 
some yeah. incidents concerning yeah. John Dee and some spirit, something like that. Yeah, right. And the editor of that book we have said, a copy "Well, of this that is book, all... by the way. It's a so, great book. It's a really? great book. It's um... I didn't know that, Joe. I'm going to look at that. Yeah, we have I'm a lot of things. That. We have a lot so of I, I like yeah. to know where the 007 connection not is. Yet, yes, so, not, sorry. Yet. <laughs> not yet, Jim. I'm getting there. I'm yes. getting there. Um, so he wrote this book and the editor of the book um, said, so the editor of, of John Dee's Angelic Diaries said, this is obviously all nonsense. Dee was obsessed. He was a fanatic. He was overly enthusiastic about this and he was misled by Edward Kelly. Um, and wasn't he a silly man for believing all this? Um, but then other people read it and put other interpretations on it. So um, the English scientist Robert Hooke, um, who was very involved in the um, early Royal Society, a scientific society in England, um, and uh, wrote heavily on scientific topics, he suggested that this book of angelic um, conversations, which in which Dee and Edward Kelly, it's almost presented like um, a play. So it says Dee said this and Edward Kelly said this. And then the angel Gabriel said this. Right. And then the angel Uriel said this or this spirit called wow. Alvage says this. Um, and then it also has kind of tables of a mystical language that Dee believed the spirits were revealing to him. Um, Robert Hooke looked at all of this and said, no, 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 Dee wasn't um, just like a confused, crazy man who believed in all this nonsense. These books are code. And he said that Dee, with his traveling across Europe, so he made many journeys all across Europe throughout his life, mm -hmm. um, and his work for the Queen and his, his advice to the Queen, and these books that don't seem to make any sense, this all points to him being a spy. Yeah. Excellent. So Hook but said what D was, was spy. <laughs> yeah, so he says D was engaged on matters of state um and that all these books and all his accounts of his travels and his voyages were cryptographical. It was cryptography, it was a code he was using. And that was definitely one of D's interests. He had books mm. about code making and code breaking in his library. Mm. Um so Robert Hook is one of the first people to say this is what's going on and if D were caught with these books he could say oh no no no! i'm just i'm just into spirits it's nothing yeah. about no no these aren't secret messages to the queen um and so that's another undercurrent that's carried on through interpretations of d's life through the centuries um but the 007 business comes along in the 1960s uh, hold, hold on hold on a second you're not gonna get off that easily Katie. so what say you uh so what is the can we prove one way or another that he was a spy for the queen when he was traveling through Europe or is where does the, what's the consensus on that? Um, so my feeling is mm -hmm. that we have to understand what a spy might be at that time differently right. to how we'd see it today, because, you know, today you are officially employed by a secret service MI6 or the CIA or something, and you were sent off on a mission, and they'll deny all knowledge later, but there's there's kind of an organization there. And I think in the 16th century, it's a much looser network of informants. And to the extent that there is any kind of um, secret service or that there is a, a spy master yeah. to Queen Elizabeth, um, you know, usually said to be Francis Walsingham, he's not forming a, a distinct network, but he's gathering information from wherever he can. So it's quite likely that Dee brought some information back with him from his travels on the continent. And whether that was secret information or whether it was just useful information about, you know, it might have been about the latest fashions or, you know, a bit more. It might have been a bit more to do with intrigue. I don't think he was, so, yeah, I don't think he was formally employed as a spy because right. he's not a James Bond figure. He's not suave. He's not charming. Um, he really struggles throughout his life to hold down any kind of paid employment where he gets a regular income. And he's always mm. trying to get more of a secure position with the queen. So he gets called the queen's conjurer or the queen's philosopher, but he never had an official mm -hmm. title from but he, Elizabeth. But he sounds like he may be a little bit similar to the real James Bond in that they, you know, neither one of them are spies or technically we can't prove it one way or mm. another. Uh, you said that, well, you have to understand that back in the 16th century, there wasn't really such a thing as spies as we know it today. Uh, so there are, I can see some similarities. Uh, yeah, and they're both, I mean, the two, they're in, really, in an interesting way. Yeah, they're both really dedicated to their studies and their researches. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think Dee 
went out shooting birds very much. Um, but he was he was interested in the natural world. He was interested in in study to the exclusion of almost all else. So he he went on these extraordinary journeys, taking sometimes taking his family with him, sometimes not, um, to further his research interests. And I mean that sounds a lot like the real James Bond, who was you know traipsing around. Uh, right the yeah. caribbean islands you know looking looking for his birds kind of it sounds like it was kind of to the exclusion of almost everything else jim yeah they're also both affiliated with trinity college in, <laughs> yes. in england and yeah so kind of yeah small world as well but that's an amazing story about uh d i didn't realize how, how polymath that's the word for yeah it. very very polymath so here you are uh katie you're mm. working on curating this exhibition. You're gathering his books, and yeah. you're re uh, you're restructuring his library as much as you can. Mm. And then, then you stumble upon this 007 uh, rumor. Tell us about. Now we're ready for you. We're ready now we're ready for it. Book. Okay. Yes. Um, so if you read any popular account of John Dee's life, so if you look him up online or um, you read about him in guidebooks to historical sites where he's mentioned, um, for example, Manchester Cathedral in the north of England, um, some of the guidebooks written about that mention this apparent fact that John Dee was the first 007. Um, and it is said and it is repeated very often that when he was writing his spy letters, his informants letters back to Queen Elizabeth and to Francis Walsingham and, and other um, ministers of her court, he would sign his letters, not with his name, but with a cryptic signature that looks like two zeros or two letter O's, followed by a long elongated seven. Ooh. And the story goes that Ian Fleming heard about this and adopted that as the other part of the identity theft for his spy that he was uh-huh. writing about. The only problem with this story is that I have never been able to find any evidence for it. So as far as I can tell, it first pops up in a book that was published in 1968 um, by a man called um, Richard Deacon, which is a pseudonym for Donald McCormick. Mm-hmm. And Deacon McCormick uh, wrote a load of books throughout his life about spies, all sorts of different spies. Um, He's said to have served in some sort of secret service or intelligence office in the Second World War. Um, And it clearly took root with him because he's he wrote lots and lots of books, um, many of which I think are hard to verify about these topics. Mm -hmm. And his book on D is called John D, Scientist, Geographer, Astrologer and Secret Agent to Elizabeth (laughs) I, which is a great title. Yes, right. he gets straight in there on page four of the books of, of the book. He says that Dee's letters to Elizabeth were signed, quotes, with two circles guarded by my, by what might have been a square root sign or an elongated seven. And he prints a little picture of this, which absolutely looks like something that someone has just drawn for an illustration in 1968. <laughs> it's not a facsimile of a manuscript. And he doesn't. This is a thing that drives librarians mad. Am I right? He doesn't yep. cite any of his sources. Oh. He doesn't say the manuscripts he's looked at. He doesn't say any of the other books he's read. He just puts this out here with no proof. And it's possible, I think, that Ian Fleming knew Deacon or knew his work and so took 007 from this, thinking it was related to John Dee, Mm. taking it at face value. But I have um, consulted, there are only a handful, there are only five or six letters um, from Dee to Elizabeth or um, senior members of her court that can be tracked down today. Um, They're mostly at the British Library. And... um, there are a couple at the National Archives in, in Kew in London, um, and they are all signed with things like John D or maybe Johannes D. So that's <laughs> John D in Latin, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not signed with any kind of mysterious signature. But this story has totally taken off because it's just it's so beguiling, isn't it? It's so cool to think um, that there's this link all the way back to Elizabethan England. Um, 
but there's no proof. And when we held, so I held this exhibition about D in 2016, and this was one of the most common things people would ask me. So I'd, I'd take people on a tour um, and show them the amazing books we have in the Royal College of Physicians Library that belong to D, that were annotated by D. And then we get to the end of the tour and people would say, yes, but wasn't he also a spy? Wasn't he the real 007? <laughs> right. It's like oh, no. everyone's heard of it. And I just had to say, nope. <laughs> I've never seen the evidence and I, I put a call out I, I wrote a letter to one of the national papers over here and said you know if anyone's seen anything definitive let me know because I'd love to know and nope, nothing's come in so the 007 no proof of that let's just assume that's not true did not mm. not associated with John D but it is possible that Ian Fleming thought that was the case yes interesting Hmm. Okay. Although, again, no proof, no proof. Um, hmm. And it suddenly occurs to me, what was the date? Do you know the date, Jim, of Ian Fleming's first Bond novel? Uh, 19, he started writing it in 1952. Yeah, so, so before 68. I this is well, that. yeah, this is well before 68. So it's almost certainly the other way about. No, so but, that so we can say right now yeah. that there, that's not true. That and double Fleming is, died in 64. Right. So, mm-hmm. so he didn't know about that. He connection. didn't know. No. Okay. Mm-hmm. And anyone who, and it gets written online really often that he took the idea from, from Deacon's mm-hmm. book and it's, yeah, it's just not true. Beware what you read online or in print. Yes. Just beware what you read. If it looks too yeah. good to be true. But it's interesting that we can use a sexy topic of spies and, and that type of thing to bring attention to John D and his work and ornithologists and why they're so important. So there is that hook. That's what kind of captures the imagination of a lot of people. And then in special collections, we're all, we're always kind of looking for something that's kind of shiny mm-hmm. and attractive to at least uh, make people interested and then get into it in a, in a little bit of a deeper way. But, uh, well, I'm glad that we resolved that. So John D. Uh, did some kind of investigation work. Um, I know that, Jim, in your book, you had said, as you talked about just now, that some of the his coworkers were uh, working for the OSS. But you could not definitively say, and you kind of leave it open in your book, that the real James Bond was working for the, you kind of leave it open. You don't say he was or wasn't, that there's no proof to the fact that he worked for the OSS. Is that right? Right. And I did a lot of, you know, down at the National Archives, I looked up all the information I could find about James Bond and found nothing. But on the other ornithologist spies, I found, you know, file folders filled with information of what kind of guns they carried and (laughs) gas masks and all kinds of things. So I think if he were a spy, it would have come out in the National Archives. But the one thing I found that was it raised an eyebrow was that he traveled to the Caribbean, uh, usually a cheapskate traveling on a mail ship. He traveled on this really fancy uh, ocean liner called the SS America. And Mm -hmm. he went to uh, Haiti on the ship. And it turns out that on the same voyage were at least two Nazi spies, part of the Duquesne spy ring. Mm. And so I wondered, what is Bond doing on the same ship with these Nazi spies? And, uh, oh, that was pretty fascinating. Right. It uh, sure is a coincidence that he was on that same ship. Um, Yeah. The layers of myth around this story are so fascinating. Because I feel like, I feel it's just like layers of myth on myth on myth. (laughs) <laughs> and it's yes. also um, layers of conspiracy theory on conspiracy theory. I can see a wide range of people being very interested in digging deep in this collection that we have at the library. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and it's an interesting thing because you want to dispel conspiracies, like you mm-hmm. know, us as librarians are into facts, and if you can't prove something, it doesn't exist. But unfortunately, that it does we're having this show because of James Bond, the, the fictional character. And mm-hmm. uh, James Wright writes a book about James Bond, the real James Bond, the ornithologist. Uh, John D., who is a polymath, somehow it, people want to know what's his connection to 007. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. 
And, um, well, great. Thank you so much, all of you, for participating in this conversation. Uh, the whole, anybody can come and visit the rare book department of the free library where we're going to have the James Bond collection. Uh, we're also going to have a map that was made by John D hanging on the wall. You don't have to ask for it. It's there. You come into a room and you can see it and you can (laughs) see his little, uh, uh, signature or was it uh, a glyph that he used to, uh, to sign his name, so to speak. But, uh, Thank you all for for participating with us in this fun. conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and we, thank you, Jim and Katie. Like this was, I learned so much, and your expertise is just brings so much life and light to the collection. I learned a lot myself. And yeah, I me too. I, I wish I could have seen your exhibition. I was actually flirting with the idea of going to uh, England to see it. <laughs> well, I'm honored to think you even considered that. It's a long way to come. Um, I hope one day maybe to make a bit more of it available online, but, you know, time and resources and all of that. Yep. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, see you uh, next time. <laughs>